So Peter, welcome to Digital Value Creation. It's great to see you again, and I'm glad you could join us. I know you had a big road trip behind you, so I'm glad you made it safely back to Philly. It is good to be back here. Good to, to finally get going on some summer work. Uh, but lots of interesting things going on and happy to talk about them for you. Thanks, Peter. As we discussed, I wanted to, I think many people know you, but in terms of introduction, you're obviously a professor of marketing at Wharton. You have a long history, a decades long history, focusing on customers, picking the right customers, creating value with the right customers. And in the last five to 10 years, you uh, especially focus on how to measure the value created for enterprises through those customer interactions. And I thought it's going to be very interesting for us to have that dialogue between technology and um, value creation, because some people may not know you had a very successful startup around analytics and customer analytics that you sold to Nike in 2015, I believe. And you were in the you working on a similar effort to uh, measure value creation based on this new um, um, research, which is uh, customer-based uh, corporate valuation. So welcome to Digital Value Creation. Uh, it's a thrill for me to, to talk about uh, my activities in general, but especially with someone who understands and uh, understands that world a lot better than I do, and therefore can appreciate uh, the kinds of inroads I'm trying to make into it. Uh, one of the things we think about, so when we when I talk to technologists or entrepreneurs in the context of value creation, which is uh, the focus of private equity in general, clearly, um, there's a lot of focus on efficiencies, cost, and and, um, and and improvements. One of the most important areas, however, for investors is top line growth and how we can expand the business. And you clearly focus on this area yourself. Um, so I, I want to dive into that uh, uh, on, on this this show, I'd love to get your perspective on the kind of technology you're seeing out there, what, what gets you excited. Uh, but before we get there, let's address what you think happened in the crisis to the customer, to customer relationships. And I want to dive into a little bit what you thought uh, companies did well and maybe not so well, how they addressed, especially the customer relationships. Is that okay? Absolutely. I'm happy to talk about it, although I'm not happy with the way it's gone. I think that from the angle that you just mentioned, the COVID crisis has been a disaster. I mean, beyond just the the, the obvious disaster of having a pandemic. Uh, you, you know, when it all first started in mid-March, I'm always looking for a silver lining. And I noticed that as I'm going from quick service restaurants to quick service restaurant, using the apps, which I never used before, uh, realizing, hey, you know, they got much de better data now than they did pre-pandemic. And they've done nothing with it. It's been it's been shameful to see the ways that, that companies haven't used the better data. Um, but they've been so busy uh, dealing with crisis management. You hear every every company saying we've done ten years of innovation in the last ten weeks. Well, you know, if you think that curbside pickup is a growth strategy, you have problems. Whereas if by understanding customers and looking at the drop in sales and saying, well, wait a minute. Is it that our most valuable customers have abandoned us? Or maybe it's just those one and done customers? We need to know that. You know, is it that we're acquiring fewer customers or they're, stay, they're, they're churning faster or they're buying less often or they're spending less than we do? We need to know that. So companies have not managed well. They have not learned from it. Uh, and, and to make it even worse, when they start furloughing people, the first ones to go are those nerds and analytics. We can do without you. We need the supply chain people. Um, so it's it's been terrible. Uh, and I think that companies, besides the obvious main effect of the pandemic, which is tragic, I think companies have really dug a hole for themselves. It's going to be hard to get out of. Yeah, and it's interesting you're saying the response is uh, one of the things I noticed just in the neighborhood, not even in our customers, is is how some companies were so agile. I mean, uh, maybe it's the immense resource like Domino's. In, in about two hours, they shifted their website and, and, and how, they, how they can respond to the different delivery methods. And they kept tweaking this over time. And then you saw a, a restaurant chain or the neighborhood restaurant that, that, that had the phone lines packed and they couldn't even take customer orders. And they never occurred to them to even get to the baseline, not even talking about the data you talk about, but just being able to get on the web and take orders online. And everybody obviously was great for Instacart and the, and the like and the delivery services, but a lot of businesses clearly struggled. And it's not even getting to the data point, which is 
this would be the time to mine your data, reach out to customers with better insight and, and pick your customers. One of the big things you talk about in your book, Customer Centricity, is, is identifying the right customers and, and focusing on them. Um, so do you have examples of companies you think did it well? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> Again, I can, we can point to companies, and you mentioned Domino's, lots of companies that have done just purely operational things in order to stay afloat, in order to, to squeeze a little bit more efficiency there. But again, it, as important as efficiency is, and I'm not in any way diminishing it, that's not growth. Just you know, finding ways to do things a little faster, a little cheaper, that's great, that, but that's kind of table stakes, and that's not going to ultimately make shareholders happy. They want more, not just lower costs. Uh, and so, again, it's it's understandable that that's where companies have been putting their, their primary attention. They almost be foolish not to, but they should have been putting some attention on some of the potential post-pandemic growth opportunities, doing some of the learning, sowing some of the seeds, refining some of the systems that would not only help them keep the doors open tomorrow, but help them make more money the day after. And, and speaking of, of using mass amount of data and, and for, for growth, you, you're clearly focused on this area, both from an analytics perspective, but I assume you see uh, emerging technologies in AI and, and other parts of digital and machine learning that could, that could mine this information and provide customers better insight and companies better insight, uh, rather. Um, what, are you seeing some trends that gives you hope that that is actually directional, what's going to happen going forward? Yes and no. Uh, it's, it's not about the tools that you just mentioned. If anything, those are going to keep us stuck in the present for a long time. Because there's just a lot of folks out there who are just overwhelmed with the tools that you just mentioned. They're overwhelmed with the all the different new data sources that are emerging. They're overwhelmed with the kinds of decisions that they can make now that they couldn't have thought about five years ago. So, so in terms of, of all the stuff in front of us, it's really leading to more of kind of an, an analysis paralysis than it is to, to genuine transformation and growth. But where I do see hope, isn't so much in the tools, but in the people. Uh, and I look at the folks who are starting to take on executive positions now. I look at you know a lot of traditional firms that are gobbling up some of the digitally native firms that, that really understand this stuff innately. And so I think we're going to start seeing people asking the right questions, uh, wanting to make the right decisions. And then instead of just saying, hey, we have these tools and all this data, what do we do with it? To do it in a more principled, a more guided way, saying, I know what kind of decision I need to make. I know what tool I need. I know what data I need. And then kind of sorting through a lot of that noisy stuff in order to, to use it wisely as opposed to trying to uh, consume all of it. I remember in one of your past speeches, you talked about that when you wrote the book, Customer Centricity, of course, every company thinks they're customer centric. And uh, and I think in this time, and I mean, a lot of we, customers, uh, our customers, but also companies saw their sales drop and, and there were a lot of acrobatics trying to get things back on track. And they were thinking that they were doing the right things in terms of customer centricity. What do you think companies don't get about this concept? So I'll give you a very simple, very specific example. I want to talk about Neiman Marcus. Now, of course, it's in some ways a problematic example because we know that they're kind of a retailer on the ropes right now. And that's not why I'm talking about them. Uh, I'm talking about them because of an experience that I had in, in Denver. Uh, and so, you know, I'm a big Neiman Marcus shopper, you know, whatever high tier in the lo loyalty program. When they started opening up the store, I was spending a lot of the, the pandemic out in, in Denver. Um, uh, and then I had to wait in line uh, behind, you know, six feet away from, but behind lots and lots and lots of other people in order to go into the store to drop like, you know, to make like $2,000 of purchases. They should have known better, based on my history with them, that I should have come right to the front of the line, or that they should have called up people like myself and said, hey, listen, we're going to have special hours just for the high-value customers. We don't want you to wait because we know how valuable you've been. We project how valuable you might be in the future. Uh, and so it's just wrong when companies are just focusing purely on efficiency instead of saying, you know, uh, the first people literally, you know, online or uh, uh, or, or to walk in the store should be the most valuable ones. It should be both a reward for your past patronage as well as a uh, kind of a projection of what you'll be worth. Thought doesn't even cross them. And of course, I'm not being rude. I'm not saying, hey, do you know who I am? You know, I'm going to do that. But they should know who I am. and They should be doing that kind of thing. And again, it's not just them. 
that that kind of anecdote is unfortunately entirely typical. This would have been a good time for firms to reach out to the more valuable customers and show them that little bit of extra love uh, and show them that, uh, that, that we know that our future depends on customers like you. And, and we're going to really you know, try to show you that value right now. You know, it's interesting because uh, you and I spoke several times before about uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by showing uh, businesses the actual value of their customers mean. Because I think uh, businesses talk about customer value, but it's not on the financial statements, clearly. So so because of that, it doesn't show up. It show up as assets, it show up in labor, it shows up as inventory. Um, so when you talk, and you obviously see this across the board, you, you deal with undergraduate you know, students, you deal with, with MBAs, you deal with uh, uh, in your consultant uh, business, you deal with the executives. Why do you think that's so hard to grasp the concept of customer value and, and, and understanding that that is actually the lever you need to push? Uh, that is the key question. And on, on one hand, it's, it's understandable, but it's also time to wake up and smell the customer value. You know, look, we have certain accounting rules. There are ways that we do things. We have standards. We have, uh, it, so it, it's understandable why we don't want to just rush into some kind of intangible asset. But at the same time, if you look at the kind of research that I and and many of other people like me are doing around the country, around the world, customer behavior is actually very, very, very predictable. It's at least as predictable as as other kinds of of operating assets. You you know how long they're going to last and you know the value that you're going to bring over that horizon. You can take that asset and you can put it on the balance sheet. You can amortize it. You can understand some of the uncertainties with it. Customers are no different than machines in that regard. Uh, and so we really should change the accounting rules. And this is a bold thing to say, but I'm serious about it, um, to be able to, to do the same kind of revenue recognition for customers as we do for operating assets. And all the time these days, companies are coming to me and saying, you know what, even if we can't do it on the balance sheet, we know we should be doing it anyway. We have this fiduciary responsibility to recognize the value of those assets and then to allocate our resources accordingly. So whether it's with investors or just executives, we're very serious about this customer-based corporate valuation thing. And we're, we're just, just delighted to see that the kind of uh, response that it's got, the kind of proactive outreach that we've seen from executives and investors around the world wanting to know more, wanting to try it out on their own. I was talking to actually two separate experts in the last couple of days about sales and marketing, and, and they argue that um, marketing actually advanced so much instead of looking back and predicting, like using predictive analytics from past behavior of customers, predicting what's going to happen. Now we're living in the experience economy. There's constant checkpoints along the way in customer interaction. How are you feeling? How are you doing? How are we doing? Don't, don't you think that some of that prediction ability, like we understand the customers now, we can, we can understand how they're going to behave in the future. Don't you think the technology is actually catching up with that, uh, that mandate? I think the technology is too far ahead of it. I think that's actually a problem, believe it or not. And I'm not knocking a lot of customer experience stuff. I'm a marketing professor, right? I, I celebrate that. As a consumer, I, I love to enjoy it. But the technology uh, really has outstripped our ability to understand customers. So my advice is let's just kind of put all that stuff on the back burner for now. Let's make sure that we fundamentally understand the behavior of our customers uh, at, a, at a granular but but understandable level. So I'm not saying I want to understand every single touch point, every little step in the funnel. That's too much. But just fundamental behaviors like, you know, how many of them are we going to acquire? And how long are they going to stay with us? Just how many transactions are they going to make? And how much are they going to spend when they make those transactions? Let's just understand those fundamentals and then start to bring in the customer experience, start to bring in the the, 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 the social this or the biometric that all the cool, shiny objects that marketers are thinking about. Let's understand how they differentially impact the kinds of behaviors that I mentioned and then start to decide how we should be allocating. So again, let's use the behavior to drive those kinds of CX decisions. And then on the back end, after we do that big customer experience campaign, let's evaluate it, not in terms of how much stuff we sold during that campaign, but in terms of which kinds of customers interacted with it. What is their lifetime value and how much higher is it now as a result of the campaign? So let's evaluate those market activities with that forward-looking lens of, of lifetime value. Isn't part of the issue, Peter, the, the lack of measurement in terms of 
what the executives are measured on, that's what they're focused on. This is there are no KPIs around focusing on customer lifetime value or or uh, uh, or some things you talk about cohorts and and uh, and and measuring that. However, there's focus on revenue and earnings and, and EBITDA and cash flow. Um, and, and I know you talk uh, several times you talk about companies that actually do this well already. There's voluntary reporting around like customer cohorts and, and buying behavior over time. It, is part of the, is it, are companies doing this because they there's no clearly no mandate for it, but are, are they measured on it or is it because they found out the connection between this and, and, and corporate growth? That is the question that's driving my life okay. for the, the, these last few years and for the, the next many to come. Is is I want to uh, you, you know, so many of the marketing assets, like customer experience, like branding, are so intangible. There is no way that any CFO on, on the planet would ever, you know, really take them seriously. But the, the the simpler behavioral metrics, how many will we acquire, how long will they stay, those are getting very, very financial. And my contention, not just my contention, my well-proven experience is that if we understand these metrics, then we can understand revenue and free cash flow much more effectively than if we ignore those metrics. Again, if I know, here we go again, how many customers are we going to acquire and how long are they going to stay and how often they're going to transact and how much margin we're going to make off of them when they do, add all that up, project that out, that's free cash flow. And so we can do, first of all, a better job of projecting free cash flow by doing it through these components. And secondly, of diagnosing the changes in free cash flow. So it's, it's leveling off. Well, is that because acquisitions are down or because retention's down? So, so we can do the finance stuff the way they want to do it, revenue and free cash flow, more effectively by bringing in the right financially oriented marketing metrics. And that's exactly what we're doing. As you said, a bunch of companies are often disclosing these things. Not even sure why they do that. Very often they do it as part of their S1 statement in the IPO. It's like, hey, we have all these shiny object metrics. Um, and, and we're showing how we can actually take those meaningful metrics and reverse engineer them to come up with free cash flow and to make that decision about what that IPO is worth. Uh, and so we're really making that connection and people are starting to pay attention to it. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So what you said is really not a technology, lack of technology problem. It's not even a lack of uh, maybe understanding the connection it, so, is some le some leaders dial dial in into this and some are aren't yet. We we hope that the enlightened few will will be listened to by others, but at the same time we're going to keep knocking on the doors of of uh, financial regulators. So we, you know we're having all these conversations with with FASBI and with their international counterparts to, to say you know we got all those data out there. Let's develop some standards about which of these metrics should be reported, uh, what kind of verbiage we should use, what kind of caveats, what kinds of companies should or shouldn't do it. So let's have a very serious conversation about it. But at the same time, basically um, educating and pushing investors to be demanding the right kinds of metrics from the companies that they're investing in. So, so we, we spoke about value. So I know you said that technology is ahead of the game in many ways. It just clogs up the attention span. But I will ask you about technology. So putting your uh, uh, marketing professor hat on, there is clearly a lot of innovation, especially in digital innovation in marketing in general. And, and uh, I think uh, we picked up from your tone, some you consider valuable, some you consider maybe ahead of its time, maybe even hype. What are the kinds of things you think that's that's real, that's valuable, that's timely versus things that you may say it's probably just way out of its time or maybe just hype? Yeah, it's, first of all, I appreciate that that, that distinction you're making. Uh, so it all comes down first to uh, to walk before you can run. So before we get into a lot of the, the, the cool new stuff, whether it's ahead of its time or hype, um, let's first make sure we're squeezing all the value we can out of the, the, the digital assets that are right there at our fingertips. Let's start with transaction logs. So before we bring in all of the different funnel activities and social media and, and other kinds of attitudinal measures, like, do you like us? Um, let's just look at who bought what when, which can be, it's boring, but really insightful. Squeeze all the value out of it. And then let's start to layer on the next pieces. Like, like I said before, let's look to understand uh, for the people who did participate in this campaign, how are they different in these behavioral transactional terms than people who didn't? Uh, and then when we find the most valuable customers, we start to say, what makes them different 
So one of their characteristics, whether it is demographics, whether it is the way their brain works, whether it is who they talk to in the social network. So let's bring in some of that data in a more principled way. Let's kind of know what we're looking for instead of just kind of mucking around in it and hoping that, that something significant pops out. So, if, and so if, if we're thoughtful and if we kind of build in layers rather than trying to you know, build some just ginormous system all at once, um, we can actually um, make good use out of it and, and then bring in those new data sources more on an as-needed basis when we're better able to take advantage of that. So it's it's uh, it's probably the question that you may have answered already. One of my big questions is if if uh, if you sat down with a CEO that may be new in new in his role or her role, and uh, and you lay out a, you know these are the kinds of things you want to look at in your marketing. And let's let's assume they are in a uh, in a uh, repeatable business where where customer behavior is somewhat predictable. Uh, what would you say? You know, this should be your top three things you look at when it comes to to marketing and growth. Yeah, and this has been the, the, the big change in my life because for, again, I've been a professor 30 plus years. And for most of those years, I've, I would try to motivate all the marketing stuff like, hey, the customers are different and you should really understand that and send this message to those people or that message to these people. Um, and that's going to win over the CMO, sure. But the CEO, the CFO are going to go, oh, that's nice. you know. Um, and that's why this, this, this pivot to customer-based corporate valuation all of a sudden, I now have their attention. That if I can tell them that we can do a better job of coming up of doing that corporate valuation and understanding why valuation is up or down and what are the operational drivers and implications from that, it's like step into my office. So, so even though I'm a marketing guy, I understand that the heart and soul of the company is finance. Uh, and so, if we can get the without going to the finance people and saying you're doing your job wrong just to say, hey, we can just layer in some of our marketing metrics. You can have the same kind of corporate valuation approach you had before, free cash flow at the heart of it. We're just going to help you do that one piece a little bit better. And oh, by the way, we can use the exact same model that we're using for the crazy kids in marketing to help them send the right email to the right person. So it all starts to come together. We get their attention, we show them improvement, and we give them kind of direct uh, actionable steps that they can take in order to not just understand value, but improve it. Uh, that's when it all starts to fit together. Yeah. And uh, what do you think? Is the crisis accelerated these conversations or slowed them down? Because I could see they both ways. Yeah, it, it, for the most part, it slowed it down. Uh, as we said before, part of it is companies just got distracted for good reason uh, as the crisis was rolling out. And a lot of private equity firms were just kind of sitting on the sideline, just saying, you know, we have plenty of dry powder here, but we're just not quite sure what kind of businesses we should be investing in or, frankly, what they're worth. So, so there, there, there's been a, a slowdown, uh, uh, but at the same time, as we come out of it, I'm not sure I agree with this or not, but a lot of companies are saying it's a whole new normal. The old rules mm -hmm. don't apply. The old multiples don't apply any longer. And so we have kind of a clean slate over here. Let's start from scratch. Let's bring in better methodologies. So, so we've been having some, some great conversations with companies who might not have been open to this CD, CD discussion had the pandemic not occurred. Uh, so again, silver lining. Uh, the time will tell whether it's uh, whether they kind of get back to their old traditional ways as, as things start to normalize or whether this kind of new normal uh, will, will continue to dominate the practices. Um, thanks, Peter. And I actually had a final question uh, as we come to the end of this, this conversation is, um, we're obviously in the middle of a pandemic. We couldn't have this conversation on campus for a reason. Um, what makes you hopeful about recovery, especially uh, recovery from a customer perspective? Uh, a couple of different things. Uh, number one, it's just the, the sheer passage of time, that as time goes by, uh, we have the capability to collect and leverage better data. I mean, just where we are in terms of data understanding and infrastructure is so much better than it was uh, today than it was five years ago. Uh, and at a, at a point that I raised before, which is kind of the changing of the guard, uh, that, that the, the next generation of CEOs is going to be very, very different than, than, than today's generation. I'm saying that with all due respect. <laughs> Um, uh, they're just going to—they're going to be born into uh, kind of a digital way of thinking about things. They're going to be born into 
understanding that not all customers are created equal and that that understanding customers is at least as important as you know being good at product development. So a lot of it is just the sheer passage of time. But as I said before, and as anybody out there would know, is this uh, this presumption that, that that life is changing and, and we can kind of throw out the old rule book and start with a new one. I'm actually skeptical about that. I think that behavior isn't going to be as fundamentally different. But I hope that people do think that because that they'll be more open to the kinds of practices that I'm espousing. I certainly uh, hope so. And, uh, and, you know, I believe in uh, in what you're doing. So um, let's keep that hope as, uh, as our closing thought. Uh, thanks a lot for joining. I think we could spend a lot of time on this conversation. So maybe we'll pick it up later, too. Thanks, Peter, for joining the show. Uh, it's a pleasure talking to you. And, and I hope that, that, that you and all your listeners uh, find some insight from these comments.